I mean, it's funny, but really, th there is a time to do things different, right? I mean, and now it's 2020, and we're asking for 2020 vision. What's 2020 vision? To believe that God's, God's prophets, right? Second Chronicles, 2020. How much longer do we want to hang out in this place where we, we're comfortable? I personally want to go home. Amen. I believe it's Jesus' will that we go home. Amen. I can't believe it's his will that this keeps going on like it is. And you know, the devil would love for us to stay his execution. Amen. And Peter talks about how we can hasten the day. Do you, do you believe we can hasten the day? Yeah. I mean, the Bible says that, right? So how do we discern the times? How do we begin to think differently? What is it that caught the church on fire? All these young people. The world, the Bible says, were turned upside down by how many people? How many? Twelve? Yeah. And they were all killed. Why? Because the world couldn't stand it, could they? You think the world could stand it? The world is not waiting for people to just keep preaching the gospel. The world has seen this. The world is waiting for the demonstration. They're waiting to see Jesus. And they're only going to see Jesus through us. The Bible says that God's people will be known by what? Love. Their love, one to another. How much do we love one another? You know, we got to watch out for our brother and our sister. You know? I, I, I found that when people get older, they get, they get weak. You know? They're not as steady on their feet as they once were. Things happen. Confidence wanes. What's a child? You can see in a child when confidence comes, everything in that child's life changes, doesn't it? I mean, they become just a gust of fire, right? When are we going to have that kind of confidence in the Lord that we can have that gust of fire that young children have when they first grasp onto it? That's what we need. We need to look to Jesus and be filled with His faith. That's what the real message is here today. A time to read and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and yes, even the Bible says a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their hearts, in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. What does it mean? What does it mean that God has set the world in their heart. Some translations say eternity, right? What, what do you reckon that means? It means that something is eternal. God has put them in your heart. Something is eternal, right? There must be a God or the planets, the atmosphere, something has to be eternal. You know, there's many there's many churches out there that, that tell you that, you know, you're going to live forever. Right? Don't they say that? What does the Bible say? What does 1 Timothy say? 6.16. Only Jesus, only God, right, has immortality. Right? There is not life forever in anything else. Jesus, who is the creator, is the life giver. If you're going to have immortality, it must come from Him. Correct? Amen. That's ex exactly what the Bible says. You know, when you look at a picture, I I'm just a weird person because I, I see things a little different than a lot of people do. But when I look at a picture, I the first thing I wonder is who took the picture? You know what I mean? Because 
what's in the front of the picture is, is pretty obvious. You know, you see three, four people, whatever. And that, right after I asked the question, who took the picture, because I'm wondering, I've seen a lot of pictures that are pretty weird. You know, like, you know, a bear's running up behind a guy, and this guy's just taking a picture. You know, I mean, are you screaming at this fellow? <laughs> I, I, I wonder things like that. And then, you know, you look at the back of the picture. What's going on in the picture? We, we need to be thinkers, I think. Because we're too apt to just be spoon-fed so many things. You know, we're taught how to think, how to see things, how to look. Jesus was a thinker, and he taught his disciples how to think. And the, and the Bible says that he, he spoke as no man ever spoke. Right? Why did he do that? Because he was full of the Holy Spirit, right? He, he, he marched to the beat of a different drummer, let's say. Can we do that? Does he promise that we have that power? Yes. If we give our will to him and be live, it's more than a mental assent. It's more than just saying something. It's actually doing it, following it, putting on the yoke of Christ. You know, so many of us spend our whole lives fighting that yoke. You know, you don't want that yoke. But the moment we put on that yoke, we realize that's all we ever really wanted. I like to call that yoke dancing with Jesus. That may be too much for some Adventists if you want, but... You know, when, when, when somebody dances, there's somebody who's leading, and there's somebody who's following. But they look like one. We need to be led by Jesus. And he's more than willing to lead us than we are willing to be led. He said he came to condemn no one. Who was the condemner? Yeah, it's the accuser. Jesus didn't come to condemn. Do, do you think... I mean, we, we sang a song earlier that just, I couldn't even finish singing the song. It was before Sabbath school and everything, and I was singing back there with Dad, and it said that he's our counselor. You know, the vision that I got. I mean, he's our counselor. There's no better lawyer in the universe. And he knows everything. There's no charge that can come up against you that he can't answer for. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Jesus Christ is the key and the answer to every problem. That ever, to, he, he is the question behind every answer. He is the everlasting Father, the Bible even says. When we start capturing this, we can become the fire that, that once was, that began this church. And we will finish this work. And it is the young people that are going to be fired up to do it. Amen. But how are they ever going to get fired up if we're not demonstrating the gospel? Amen. And the only way that we're going to demonstrate the gospel is by dying to self. This is the toughest job that you're ever going to have. But the most rewarding. It's easy to give all your money away. It's easy to do all kinds of things. You know, fly around the world, do whatever. But to die to self, that's difficult. There's a real battle there. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes 12, seeing as we're still in that book. Let us turn to uh, 12 and 8. I don't like to trying to uh, interpret the Bible for anybody. I like to just read the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself. Yeah. You didn't come here to hear my opinion, and uh, it doesn't really matter much, but the Bible has a lot to say. And if we're listening as a little child with open ears, not believing that we know anything or coming at this with, without preconceived notions, we can see things we've never saw before. We can begin to learn like little children learn. And I'm telling you what, if, you, if you've been around little children, they learn fast. They learn like crazy. They're like sponges. Why do our minds have to get old and crusty? Because we're just too set up with what we think we know. 
Let's let go of that and grab on to Jesus. 12 and 8. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the master of, masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end. And much study is weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Do we want to shun that judgment or do we want to come into it? We want to come into it, don't we? Let us come into it where we can be blessed. Luke 16 and 17 says, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Than one tittle of the law to fail. Let us turn to Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. And I would like to begin in verse 16. Say amen and you're all there. Amen. Knowing that a man is not justified, you hear that? He is not justified by the works of the law, but by what? It's, it says by the faith of Jesus Christ, right? Even we believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by what? <clears throat> The faith of Christ. Do you hear the word the? Why is the word there the? Because it's, it's pointing to the genuine article. You follow me? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, the pattern. He is the. He has the faith. And we have to have that faith in us. It talks about that the ten virgins, right? We've talked many times about the ten virgins. But five of them had what? Extra oil in their vessels, right? What do you reckon that extra oil in their vessels was? The faith of Jesus. It's one thing to have faith in Jesus. It's one thing to say, oh, I believe in that. It's another thing to have the faith of Jesus that makes you go out and demonstrate to the world Jesus Christ. You follow me? That's what we want. That's what we need. That's what's going to catch this place on fire. And not by works of the law, for by works of the law shall no flesh be what? None should be justified by that. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? No. God forbid. Amen. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Amen. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? By the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Amen? Amen. So the beginning and the end, it's all Christ. Right? Every book in this Bible is a love letter of Jesus Christ to us. Personally. Personally. We need to read this book like it's something that needs to be studied for all the answers that's in there. It, it, it has diamonds that need to be mined out. This isn't a book you read like a novel. You know, oh, well, I put in my three chapters today. You know? This is something we need to desire. Something that we need to long for. 
I wonder how many Bibles just sit. I really do. Let us, um, let us move on and stay in Galatians and turn to uh, chapter 3. And let's pick it up in verse 8. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. You hear that? Mm -hmm. Preached before the gospel unto Abraham. How about that, huh? Saying, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. So that they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Brother B said the other day, and it was a Bible study or something, that uh, Jesus even wore the crown of thorns. He took the curse of the earth upon himself, too. Jesus has done it all, brothers and sisters. He's made it all right. We, our job is to say yes and thank you. That's what it is. Yes and thank you. Put him where he belongs first and foremost. You know, there's been a lot of talk I've heard uh, quite a bit about seek ye first the kingdom of God, and that's absolutely right. But there's another part of that, too. Lean ye not on your own understanding. Yeah. Because if you're seeking Him first, but you're still relying on your understanding, you're still sinking. You follow me? We have to be seeking Him first, but leaning on His understanding, coming to Him as a child like we know nothing. Right? How, how much was Solomon blessed? What, what did he say to God when, when God asked him, what does he want? He says, well, I'm a child, right? I don't even know what to ask for. I don't know how to come in or how to go out. Was God, can I say, was God turned on by that prayer? Did he like that prayer? Amen. Wow. God says, you're not, I'm not only going to give you that, I'm gonna give, you're going to be, you're going to be so rich that Rockefeller that's later to come, he'd be your lawnmower guy. You know? Think about that for a moment. And, and how, did, how did even the wisest man that ever lived lose his way? He lost his way. He took his focus off Jesus, right? He had, he had all kinds of understanding, didn't he? But you know what? You're, you're, it doesn't matter how wise you are. If your eyes come off of Jesus, you're going you're gonna to be corrupted. Yeah. I, I think probably Lucifer was pretty wise. He was probably pretty smart. And probably the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Right? But what happened to him? He coveted Christ's position, didn't he? He became filled with pride in his heart. What does that even say about Jesus? Stop for a moment and think. Jesus is so humble that he takes an appearance that some, something of his creation would think it's greater than him? Wow. What does that say about Jesus? He's amazing. Amen. Beyond words. You know, we try, to, we try to understand God with this mind that we have. And, and God gives us things like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost so we can try to make an understanding. These are things that are too great for us. Beyond our comprehension. The Bible says that God spreads out the heavens like a, like a curtain. You know, we're, we're just now saying, hey, you know, we're putting so, so many satellites up in the, up in the sky that we got to dim them because we can't study the stars. It's getting too bright. 
And, and they know that this, the heavens are opening up. It's, it's, it's expanding. There's no limit to what God can do. Amen. And there's one planet in all of His creation that's went wild. Oh. And you know what God did? God says, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to make it right. Do you realize that there is a man that sits on the throne of God? A man. The man Christ Jesus. He's, he, he's done it all. What more could he do for us? Listen, it's it's we see it as difficult, these struggles that we have. This life is nothing. This is this life is a it's a shot in the pan. Okay? It's a blink of an eye. Think about that for a second. The, the Bible says a thousand years is as a day. Okay? So if a man lives, what, 70 years? What, what is that in time? What is it, three days? I mean, your, your, your life is nothing. 